Sunday is the beginning of the Easter week, and we want to read from Matthew chapter 21, the Palm Sunday event, as it was given to us in the Gospels. Matthew 21, 8 to 11. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And what an event that was. So today we commemorate the triumphal entry of the king into his kingdom. There's a lot of great, wonderful events at this particular time. The events surrounding the cross uh, produced a mixture of strong emotions and torn and conflicting allegiances. In the middle of all that was going on, there was the wavering crowd. The theme of our message is the king and the wavering crowd. And uh, what an experience. The wavering crowd moved this way and that way by the various people that addressed the crowd. And in the middle of it all, this wavering crowd did not know which way to go. Uh, we find in, in John chapter 12, verse 13, it says, Blessed is the King of Israel. Now, this was the inauguration of the King of Israel. It was his coming into the kingdom. Jesus came into the world to establish a kingdom. We did one of these studies on the kingdom on Friday nights, and uh, it's a great study. So fine, we find, first of all, then the entrance of the king. Uh, here, Jesus is seen as the servant of Jehovah coming to establish his kingdom. The kingdom is described by himself in the following way, the kingdom of service. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He came as a king, but not riding on a horse. Now, all military leaders, kings, they rode on white horses, dignified, prancing, powerful horses, and indicating their status as a king. And Jesus came not as a political kingdom to establish a political kingdom, but riding on a donkey. Imagine how the crowd would laugh if a prestigious Roman, Roman ruler would come into the city riding on a donkey. Uh, they would have great fun laughing at him particularly. And so Jesus came in the dignity of humility and uh, meekness, lowliness and poverty. But it was a highly significant event because he was indeed a king. He was God's king, Amen. sent by God himself Amen. to be the king of the earth. And this was only the beginning. And he was to establish a great work in, in establishing that by the way of the cross. Jesus arranged a striking uh, dramatization of the prophecy from Zechariah 9.9, 9, and Jesus himself knew that prophecy. That prophecy had been given 400 years before this particular event. And the prophecy said, Rejoice, rejoice, O people of God. Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem. Look, for your king is coming unto you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey. Then we see the response of the crowd. The people got the message, and they responded mag magnificently uh, to what was happening. They took off their coats, and they strawed them on the path, and uh, that Jesus would be able to walk on them, or the donkey would. So he, he, they gave him what we call a red carpet treatment. And uh, the waving the palm branches which is a symbol of victory. We had that nicely done by the children this morning, and we want to thank them for that. 
And uh, the cry was, God save the king, David's son, God's man is here, long live the king. These exact words were the words that were used in the inauguration of all the kings of Israel. And so they recognized. And that's why they put a sign over his cross when they crucified him, king of the Jews. They recognized who he was. And he was the king of the Jews. By the time the jubilant crowd reached the city center, it says the whole city was aroused and all the people came together. And then the rejoicing crowds swept into the temple area. And then abruptly something else happened. When Jesus came into the temple area, he made a whip out of a rope and he drove out all the cattle and all the sheep and all the, the stuff that they were selling in the temple. And he let go all the pigeons and uh, turned over the money tables of the changer, mixed changers. And uh, he cleaned out the temple. Now that was quite an act. And uh, this was, I suppose, much to the delight of many of the worshipers. Because they had wanted to do it themselves, but they couldn't do it. They didn't have the authority to do it. But here comes the king himself. And he has the authority and he cleansed the holy temple. And the authorities, however, were very furious. And the crowd was delighted. And uh, so it seemed only a matter of time until Jesus would take over and he would deliver the children of Israel from the Roman rule over which they very greatly were bothered. And uh, so they said, he is the king of the Jews, and he is the Messiah. Now their Messiah, they thought, was going to be a military man. He was going to come and uh, win the victory over the Romans and give Israel and the nation of Israel again the great powerful position that they had at one time. But it didn't happen that way. Even the disciples you remember, they said, when are you going to establish the kingdom? And they said, come on, if you want to establish a kingdom, get out, announce yourself. And, uh, uh, but we find that he did not do that. There was a strange fickleness or an instability in the crowd, in, in the wavering crowd. It was very, very interesting to note that within five days, just five days, this very crowd was chanting different slogans. They were saying, give us Barabbas, away with Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. That is unbelievable and alarming. That people can change in five days from saying, hail, uh, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, and then turn right around and say, uh, that they want him to be crucified. This leaves us awestruck and dumbfounded that a crowd could change just like that. But there's a lot of lessons. This strange uh, wavering of the crowd at the crucifixion is a characteristic of fallen humanity throughout human history. And it was experienced by other leaders of the past in the Old Testament. Moses faced the same thing. And after the great miracle of crossing of the Red Sea and the Sinai experience, the people vowed to, to obey God and they would fo follow him. But it was less than six weeks later, they were bowing down before the golden calf. Can you unbelieve that? No wonder Moses was so angry. And when he came down and brought these tablets, he threw them down. And when he saw the people worshiping the golden calf, just six weeks later, and the wavering crowd was doing the very same thing. Elijah also faced the same situation in his ministry. Jezebel called <clears throat> the tune, and all the people, they worshiped Baal. They had 450 Baal priests, and that was the official worshiping of the nation of Israel. At Carmel, they cried out, The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, he is God. 
but it only lasted a few days. Not soon after that, Elijah was fleeing for his life, and Jezebel has vowed to take his head off. So the wavering crowd, you know, saying, He is Lord! He is Lord! And just a little later, they were persecuting again, the Christians and the followers of Jehovah. The the amazing thing is, is that we face the very same thing today. Humanity, apparently, has not changed. And humanity, whose heart has not been changed by God, is totally unpredictable. I remember it was in 1959, uh, I came into the city of Edmonton uh, just as a newly appointed missionary. And I was driving together with Bob Thompson, who was the ambassador to Ethiopia of Canada. So I was traveling with one of the chief ministers. How did that happen? Well, I, I was pastor in Calgary, and Bob Thompson, when he retired from Ethiopia, uh, he bought a house right behind the parsonage. And I was the first one over there and found that Bob was a wonderful believer, a real stalwart saint of God, and one of the co-founders of the Social Credit Party in Alberta. And uh, uh, what an enjoyable time. So as we were driving, uh, Bob said, let's go and have dinner with Ernie today. That was Ernest Manning, Premier Ernest Manning. Anyway, he called him up, and uh, Ernie usually took his lunch bucket uh, to work with him every day. He didn't go to a fancy hotel for his meals. He got a, brought lunch from home. And uh, he said, well, I can leave my lunch for later. Uh, I'll tell all the other chief ministers, and we'll all gather together in some restaurant somewhere. So we all went. And I had the great privilege of sitting there and had lunch uh, with all of the chief ministers of the Alberta government in the social credit days. And I was absolutely amazed. They were all believers, born-again believers. And they didn't talk about politics. They talked about how many Bibles that they had put in the different schools because they were all Gideons. And so they were rejoicing in what God was doing and, and how many schools and elementary schools and had received the Bibles at that particular time. And so what a time that was. And I remember right after that, that in, in the uh, Social Credit Party, they always had a very large surplus in the government every year because they never spent it unwisely. And they never funded unworthy projects or gave huge salaries to government officials. So they had plenty of big surpluses. And uh, the first year from the surpluses, they built number two highway that goes right straight through Calgary uh, from one end of the province to the other. That was uh, paid for not by the taxpayers' money, but by the surpluses from the government. And then, the next year, they paved every main street in Alberta, every main street in every town, and sidewalks and pavement, the whole works. And then, the next year, they put in old people's homes in all of the major towns in Alberta, paid for by the surpluses of the Alberta government. And then, the next year, they built an auditorium, the Jubilee Auditorium here in Edmonton, fully paid by the surpluses. The next year they built one in Calgary, fully paid by the surpluses. And then something happened to the wavering crowd in Alberta. They said, we don't want these preachers. He's preaching. Ernest Manning had a a radio broadcast, and he preached every day on the radio. How many of you remember those days? You ever heard him preach? I guess some of you are not old enough. (laughs) anyway the crowd said we want different people we want the ungodly people so they elected one and guess what in the first year itself 
they were in a, in a deficit in the Alberta government. And they've never been out of it since, except uh, that, uh, who was that one guy? Klein, Klein yes. Ralph Klein, had the, the only one who had bo backbone enough to straighten out the mess. And he had a lot of, a lot of refund from that, I suppose. But uh, he was a great leader. Since that time, we've run into huge deficits. And the, uh, the party that had been in Ernest Manning's day, they had collected a huge heritage fund from the surpluses of the government every year. And now they've been draining that surplus every year until there's nothing left of it. The wavering crowd said, we don't want these Christians to run things right. We want somebody else. And so they put them in, and that's why we're in the state we are. The wavering crowd. And this is a warning uh, to us. If we don't get godly, holy leaders who are upright and people of integrity, we're not going to make it financially. It's going to take strong people that there were in the past in those days. And so the Bible tells us, however, that before the return of Christ, there will be a great falling away of the people. And the media and the ungodly leaders can turn the mob against Christ and against his church. And that's what's happening today, unfortunately. And we could face some very perilous persecution as believers in the coming days. That's the warning. And so uh, that's what we need to know. The Bible says in the last days there's going to be only two kinds of people on the earth. The goat nations and the sheep nations. The sheep nations are those who follow God and are, are in Christ and those who are in, in the church and obeying the Lord. The sheep nations and then there are the goat nations. And we can see today, prophetically speaking, the lining up of all the nations in those two great camps. The one camp is trying to get us into a new one world system, government, one world government. They're working on that in Alberta and uh, trying to get us into the one world government. But then remember, this morning it's Palm Sunday, and the king said, I have come. Amen. And there's going to be a time when Jesus shall return to this earth riding on our white horse, Amen. gloriously victorious. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he will establish a kingdom. This time it'll be a political kingdom. And he will set up his millennial kingdom and rule the entire earth for a thousand years. Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit. And so the evil nations will be destroyed. And God will return the earth back to like it was in the Garden of Eden. Amen. Boy, we're looking forward to those days. Amen. Amen. Now, what truths can we learn from the king and the wavering crowd? Here are some lessons. Just because we know the right does not guarantee that we're going to do the right. There's a lot of people know the right, but they don't vote right. And we really, we have an election coming up in Alberta, and I hope that we're going to get back to some of those basic good principles that we used to have so that we don't have the financial problems that we have, even in this province. If Alberta can't make it without deficits, no other province in all of Canada can, because we are the richest province. We have the greatest resources, and we have God on our side. The, they used to say that Alberta is the Bible Belt of Canada, and I trust that God will return and redo it again. Amen. Praise the Lord, let it happen. And here's the crowd shouting, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And uh, the people came early in the morning to hear Jesus in the temple. 
They knew the way. They heard Jesus preach. They saw the miracles which he performed. But do you think that they would follow him? That is the sad picture of humanity. And even after all that, they cried, crucify him. Second lesson we learn, we don't learn much from history. We keep mis- making the same mistakes again and again. And in Matthew 23, verses 30, it says, The Pharisees said that if they had lived in the days of their forefathers, they would never have killed the prophets. And yet, three days later, they were crucifying Jesus on the cross. Isn't that something? They boasted they would never do that which happened to the prophets in the Old Testament. But they themselves did it. So question number three is, what is the problem? What's wrong with our people? And it's not that their head is wrong, but their hearts are wrong. The heart of man, the Bible says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? And Jesus put his finger on the problem. The people are like sheep. They are like a sheep without shepherds. And no internal anchor, no inner guidance system, and they can be very easily manipulated. You can see that in the elections. And it's a sad thing. The sinful heart of man is the big problem, and that's the reason Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem on that day on Palm Sunday. He came to correct this problem. The problem in the un, un, uh, the destruction of the heart of man. And so the solution of Jesus was that he came entering Jerusalem to be crucified as the Passover lamb who shed his blood and gave his life that we might have eternal life. And so two things uh, in the meaning of the cross, two things were happening uh, at at the same time in the cross, what men were doing and then what God was doing. The two distinct things that were happening at the crucifixion. First of all, from man's point of view, evil was overcoming good. And they had him on the cross. Satan was, uh, was gloating. We've got him at last. He's on the cross. Then we killed him. Ray! And we put him in a grave and put a stone on the grave. And that's the end of him. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory be to God. And that's a wonderful thing. And so, uh, from God's standpoint, point of view, good was overcoming evil. That was God's intent of what God was doing on the cross. Good was overcoming evil. And that's great. And men were crucifying Jesus, but God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so that's a marvelous thing that was happening there. Sin's power in the lives of people had to be broken. There was only one way that that could be done, is that he should become the Passover lamb that took upon himself the sins of the world. What a tremendous thing that is. So sin's power had to be broken. A fountain had to be opened in the house of David to cleanse the people from sin and unrighteousness, and from that wavering spirit that is in the natural heart of man. And to make uh, possible a, a new birth into the kingdom of God, and God giving us integrity and uprighteousness and blessedness. The remedy needs to be applied, however, and on the day of Pentecost, Peter made the same point about the cross. When he preached in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, this man was handed over to you by God's divine purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. And the crowd uh, were cut to the heart, and they cried out, What shall we do then? And then Peter gave that wonderful answer, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And being born again 
And receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit means that you get solid integrity of heart. The wickedness is gone, righteousness is implanted in your soul, and you become a person of integrity and uprightness. And so the New Testament church was born. And that day when Peter preached that sermon, 5,000 people accepted Christ as their Savior. And the great building of the church of God began at that time. And so those who repent and believed were filled with the divine new power. They were filled with the new dynamic, which gave them stability and boldness to stand for the truth against all opposition of rulers or the crowd. The believers of the early church were steadfast, immovable, and they cried, We must obey God rather than men. That's a great statement. Neither prison, nor poverty, nor death held any fear for them. And so what a difference that made. What was the secret of their steadfastness? They had repented and responded to God's wonderful love through Christ the Lord. And they had been filled with the Spirit, and the power of the living Christ had entered into them. Now in conclusion, what about us? We are a part of the crowd. And in a couple of weeks, the whole crowd's going to go voting. <laughs> and we better get studied up on who are the ones who uphold the biblical principles and then vote for them. And that's a very, very important thing. And uh, unless we are born again and filled with the Spirit, we can easily be talked into crucifying Christ and joining those who scoff at his name. The risen Christ offered himself as the power to transform the wavering crowd into men and women established and committed to the righteousness of God. And what a glorious thing that is. Now this Easter season, uh, I encourage you to each, each of you to read again the entire story of the, 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 the Easter weekend and... Uh, from the Palm Sunday to Good Friday uh, to Easter Sunday morning, we'll be gathering together again and to refresh yourself about this historic event. I want to read in closing uh, just a couple of verses of two songs. And uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of wonderful Easter music. Uh, I miss that Easter music. I used to sing in college choirs and stuff. And uh, some tremendous music for Easter. And... Uh, Here's one, all glory, laud, and honor. All glory, laud, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna's ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name uh, comest the King and the Blessed One. And then that wonderful old hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nations, O thou of God and man the Son, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory, my joy, and my crown. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Palm Sunday, and we remind ourselves there is a King. And he has set up a kingdom. Yes. And we want to be a part of that kingdom. Yes. We want to give ourselves in the promotion of his kingdom. Yes. And we want to stand for righteousness. Yes. And our Father, we want to pray today for the persecuted church around the world. More people are dying in, in prison in our day than there has ever been in the history of the world. And so we pray, Lord, that you would make us strong and steadfast and that we may be looking forward to the coming of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we read in the scriptures that the heavens will be rent, and the trumpet of God will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive shall be caught up with the Lord. And then Jesus shall return with mighty power with all his saints to rule the entire earth. We thank you, Lord, for the victory of the Easter season, and the message that we have to proclaim as a church. And we pray your special blessing upon us, Lord. And so we worship you, 
We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Amen.